Hello, you're watching Frontline with Lucy Fisher for Times Radio. I'm joined today by Ellen Suleymanov, the Azerbaijani ambassador to the United Kingdom, who's come on to discuss the crisis in the Gorno Karabakh. The region is internationally recognised as part of Azerbaijan, but home to a mainly Armenian population. Tensions between the two nations over the region have been running hot and cold for decades. But right now, a fresh humanitarian emergency has erupted as the only road in and out of the region has been blockaded. Ambassador, thanks for joining me today. Thank you, Ms. Fisher. Good to be with you. So let's start with the blockade. Uh, credible uh, media outlets uh, from across the globe are reporting that 120,000 people, mainly ethnically Armenian people, are blockaded within the Gorno Karabakh without sufficient food, without sufficient medicines, without supplies of all kinds. Do you accept that that's the current state of play? Uh, Ms. Fisher, no, I don't accept. And uh, first of all, the number of 120,000 uh, people is exaggerated. Everybody knows this. Uh, the Armenian authorities themselves repeatedly stated a much lower number. But that's a secondary question. The most important question, that there is no blockade. Over the last week, just over the last week, about 400 vehicles went both directions from Armenia into the town of Hankandi, which is an Armenian populated town in Karabakh. The notion of Nagorno-Karabakh, which is a Soviet established uh, autonomous oblast, was not in existence for a long time. So there is a traffic which goes back and forth. Supplies are abundant, not as much as they used to be perhaps, but there is no restriction on humanitarian travel or on humanitarian transit. So since the, I'll give you one number, uh, one um, example. Uh, from the beginning of the protest by eco activists from Azerbaijan, which was on 12th of December, to 29th of January, 1,380 vehicles traveled in both directions. That is, most of them bring in supplies, food, medicine, and all that is required for the welfare of the citizens which reside in Han Candy. So there is no humanitarian crisis per se. There is a mass protest along the line, uh, along the road, b because the road has been misused. Uh, since the trilateral statement signed by the Prime Minister of Armenia, President of Azerbaijan, and President of Russia in 2020, uh, or upon the completion of the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, it was the Second Karabakh War, which resulted in the restoration of Azerbaijan's territorial integrity. The agreement was that the road would be used exclusively for humanitarian supplies and to make sure that people uh, of Armenian origin residing as uh, citizens of Azerbaijan on Azerbaijani territory have access to Armenia back and forth. And they, they had. But since then, well, we have seen uh, travel of landmines, introduction of weapons, uh, military supplies. We have 10,000 Armenian soldiers still illegally present on Azerbaijani territory. Those questions are not just to us. They are not questions just to the Armenians living there, but also to the Russian peacekeeping contingent, which Russian uh, peacekeepers are responsible for maintaining the order and the law, uh, law and order along the Russian road. And uh, the, the question is whether they have or not. But they control the, the road. Well, there's a lot to um, uh, unpack there. So uh, let's start with the number uh, of people in there. Uh, you claiming it's a lot lower than 120,000. It does seem to be that there is an international consensus. That's f the figure. But, uh, nobody, but let me no, hear you nobody, let, nobody estimated that. It's just somebody used the number. People keep repeating it. OK, so w what is the number that Azerbaijan puts on the population? In by, the our, by our estimates, uh, based on the uh, travel of people back and forth and what we see there, we're talking about 35, 50,000 people. But again, this is not uh, this is not the most important issue. 35,000 well, 35, people, 000 or 120, uh, they still people have the same rights, of, course. of this course. I mean, this is not an issue of... But uh, we don't want to exaggerate the issue where unnecessarily. I mean, we're, we're talking about the... I mean, let's talk on, about facts. And I'm interested as well, you say that the road, and just to be clear to any um, viewers or listeners that aren't familiar, there's one road in and out of this region, it's known as the Latching Corridor, and that's the road that currently it's difficult, um, some say pretty much impossible for any, any but the Russian peacekeepers, uh, international uh, Red Crescent uh, efforts to cross. You're saying there have been um, trucks crossing, I think that's not, not the impression of uh, Armenians there. 
what my understanding is that the protests that have amassed there are um, Azerbaijani uh, activists who claim to be uh, environmentalists. Some reports have suggested that there are disguised military personnel uh, among those figures. What, what do you say to that? We have very active uh, group of young protesters who are uh, environmentalists and the concern is the, very obvious. I mean it's a well documented problem which existed and by the way was a part of a conversation for a long time is that illegally Azerbaijani uh, environmental uh, situation has been worsened by abuse and use of uh, mineral resources by the uh, we have copper, we have golden deposit, gold deposit. They're being illegally used and uh, exported to Armenia without any license, without anything, in full violation of any servant of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Let's step back for a second and just look at something. This is a sovereign territory of the Republic of Azerbaijan, which is fully recognized by the international community, by everyone, including the Republic of Armenia. The Prime Minister of Armenia himself said we recognize the servant of Azerbaijan within the borders uh, according to international law. That is within the borders of Azerbaijan. So all we want, all the people want, is to make sure that what happens there is monitored in accordance with international law and the laws of the Republic of Azerbaijan. Now, when we step back, we should look at something else. At no point, nobody prevents a civilian Armenian person traveling from Hankandi to Armenia and back and forth. Armenian authorities in Armenia and the so-called authorities, separatist authorities within Hankandi, they're preventing people from moving forward. No, no car which would carry Armenians from either Armenia to, uh, to Hankandi or from Hankandi to Armenia would, would, would be stopped. Yes, protesters create a certain limitation on the, on the road, but just to the point of protest, I mean, they don't stop anybody, they can't stop anybody because Russian peacekeeping, once again, Russian peacekeeping contingent, the military Russian force stands there in order to provide security of transit. So there was no attacks on anybody. Nobody really prevented anybody from going anywhere. The only thing. So, so just so I'm clear, you you deny that for sort of weeks at a time, the protests were stopping trucks with goods going back and forth. They insist on checking what is in the trucks, for obvious reasons, because since the signing of the trilateral statement, we had landmines planted on our territory, delivered through that road, and made in 2021. So this is one year after signing an agreement. So of course our people want to see what happens. They want to see what's being transported. But nobody opposes food. They nobody opposes medication. Nobody opposes people being going back and forth. This is not an issue. So, so just help me understand. Then you, as I, will have seen the footage of bare shelves in shops in this region. Why are supplies? Why haven't they been getting through? Why, why has there been a shortage of food? In that's, that's a good question. We, we are in a conversation with uh, both some uh, of the Armenian authorities within uh, Hankande and also with the ICRC. Azerbaijan has offered not only the transit, but also provide our, to, our, to provide our own trucks, provide our own supplies. We can provide food, medication, whatever is needed. At, at the end of the day, Armenians living on Azerbaijani ter ter territory, Azerbaijani citizens. The problem, of course, is that the Armenian separatists refuse that because all they need is to create this crisis. I'll tell you why. It's actually not that difficult to understand. One of the problems is that uh, the mandate of the peacekeeping contingent, the Russian peacekeeping contingent, ends in 2025. It's a temporary measure. So we want to have peace and normal relationship between Armenians and Azerbaijanis by that time. Apparently someone has a great interest to make sure that doesn't happen and there's a great excuse to keep uh, pres foreign presence on our soil. Another thing is that so-called leader, a de facto leader of current uh, separatist authorities within Azerbaijan and Hankandi, is a parachuted Russian oligarch who was sanctioned by Ukraine and others for his activities is a well-known corrupt man called Ruben Vardanyan. What is he doing there? How did he appear there? Why is suddenly uh, his presence there made so much noise and so many caused so many problems, both to Armenians and Azerbaijanis? Those are the real questions we need to ask ourselves. What exactly is happening? Who benefits from that? Clearly, clearly, for us, the Armenians who live in Karabakh are our citizens. We want to have a normal relationship with them. I'll give you one example. And can I ask you, Baku is happy for those Armenians to stay there, of or course. ideally would like them to leave, as some in Ar Armenia and, and elsewhere suggest? 
uh, that suggestion is an insanity for for a number of reasons. One of them, during the war, the, the Azerbaijani forces did not enter Hankende. There was a full military advantage on Azerbaijan side. We didn't do that, and the reason we didn't do that is specifically because we want uh, uh, we didn't enter the most populated. Armenian uh, city in Azerbaijan because we want them to stay. They are our citizens. We have nothing against peaceful Armenians. We have nothing against our residents. They're part of Azerbaijan like everybody else. They're, we Azerbaijan is a multicultural, diverse society. I know from my Armenian neighbors, where 99.9 percent of Armenians is ethnically Armenian, it's difficult to understand. In Azerbaijan, we do live together with Jews, Christians, Muslims, different denominations, we all live together. This is a very diverse country. So there's also a clash of understandings of how you live in a society. The other thing is that we built the Lachin Road. We rebuilt it. It became much shorter and much faster. If we want people to live, if we don't want them to have communication, why would we rebuild that? Why would be, there was no conflict or uh, any clashes with the Armenian population when we did that? Why just two days, two months before uh, this uh, situation which arose uh, from arrival of Mr. Vardanyan, Azerbaijani authorities were speaking to the local authorities in uh, Hankian, they trying to build some normalcy over use of, for use of water, use of land and all other things. I mean, those are, those are signs of normalcy. We want to see signs of normalcy, but in all honesty, nobody, no, no normal authority, no regular authority anywhere in the world would allow landmines military personnel to be transported there. Recently, for instance, we learned that nine Iranian citizens were illegally transported into this area. Why? I mean, why, do we, why do we have to learn that from somebody else? So does Baku support the protesters who are, who are on that road and making travel difficult? We understand why they're there and we share their concern, of course. And as you have it, there is no government forces as part of that protest. The government forces are located there as a part of security for the Azerbaijani side or along the road of the uh, watching road. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the geography there, there has always been an Azerbaijani force standing there next to the Russian peacekeeping force because, because part, of the, part of the road it belongs to Azerbaijan. There's the Azerbaijani city of Shusha. And the road goes right by Shusha. I mean, that's that's to understand. So they've been always there. Uh, so there is Azerbaijan security presence, but it's always been there since day one of the agreement. The main security presence, the the people who actually control the road, are Russian peacekeepers. I think this should not escape anybody's attention. No, and we and we we will come come on to that shortly. So let me ask you: Are you concerned that the current difficulties could see armed conflict reignited in this region? The last thing we see, we want, is any conflict to reignite. First of all, we have suffered a lot. We have lost about 3,000 of our people. We have lost uh, thousands of our people injured. I mean, this is a serious concern for us. We have so far inve invested billions of dollars in the rebuilding of the areas which were devastated by 30 years of illegal blockade and occupation by Armenia. Armenia illegally occupied our lands for 30 years, devastated everything, ethnically cleansed everybody. We are now rebuilding those areas, we are bringing people back. The last thing we want is war. We don't want any hostilities. And I, I believe that people in uh, Han Kendi who are Armenian don't want that. And by the way, I, I want to believe that the Prime Minister of Armenia and Armenian people don't want war either. Everybody had enough. So we should not become victims of some provocations and provocateurs. You are right, we have to find a way to make sure that this doesn't grow into any hostility because that's nobody will benefit from it. At least nobody in our region, neither Azerbaijanis nor Armenians, would ever benefit from that. It certainly feels that uh, in the West, the European Parliament, you know, last month called on Baku to lift the roadblock, that there is a view uh, that this is um, more the fault of, or solely the fault of uh, Azerbaijan, the difficulties uh, we've seen. What do you say to that? It is convenient to find an escape code always and to, you know, to exercise your biases. We, we've seen that. This is not the first time we have seen this. And you also see that in a, in a designation of either side and Azerbaijan, you know, people want to see Azerbaijan as guilty in this. The reality is not what the European Parliament wants or what other people want. The reality is what the people of Azerbaijan and people of Armenia want. And people of Azerbaijan and people of Armenia want peace. And people and leadership of Armenia today, and Armenia, not just Azerbaijan, understand 
that the provocateurs such as Ruben Vardanyan will cause long-term trouble not only uh, for the Armenian population in Khan Kandy, but also for Armenia itself. They know it very well. And that's what you could actually hear in the nuanced speeches of some of the Armenian leaders. But of course, once you move into Paris or if you move to uh, Brussels, that nuance disappears. And what we hear is a message from the lobbying group, uh, somewhat a little bit hysterical message. I understand this is a good opportunity to promote one's agenda, but doesn't help. This doesn't help. And let's talk about Russia. As you mentioned, Russian uh, peacekeeping forces um, have uh, been trying to keep the Latin Corridor open. Um, Armenia is part of a security pact, six nations, post-Soviet security pact with Russia. What's Azerbaijan's relations with Russia like? Russia is our largest neighbor. We have good working relations with Russia. At the same time, Azerbaijan is not a, unlike Armenia, is not, not part of this pact. Not, not part of the CSTO agreement. Azerbaijan's borders, unlike the borders of Armenia, are not guarded by the Russian troops. We have our own troops guarding our borders. Azerbaijan, unlike Armenia, doesn't have a Russian military bases on its territory. And Azerbaijan, unlike Armenia, doesn't ask uh, Russia always to interfere uh, on its side during the war. That's, uh, and by the way, most of supplies, military supplies, which Azerbaijan had during the war came not just from Russia, but in any, under any circumstances, they were purchased with money. Uh, Armenia got everything for free from Russia. So I think that kind of spells out where we are. At the same time... So can I ask you, is Russia trusted as an honest broker? I mean, at the moment, it seems to me like Russia's quite distracted in Ukraine, and that's certainly a complaint from the Armenian side, that Moscow hasn't stepped in here to try and um, broker a, a, a new deal or resolution to the blockade. Uh, so in, in a way, what you described now is Armenia is complaining that, not complaining that Russia is not an honest broker. They complain that Russia does not act as its, uh, as its military support. Quite right. No, no. They, so exactly. Armenia complained that Russia is distracted, not stepping in. Yeah. But I, my question to you is, given uh, that uh, Armenia has much closer military and security links with Russia, does Azerbaijan view Russia as an honest broker in the situation around Nagorno-Karabakh? Let me put it this way. It is in the best interest of Russia to be an honest broker. At the end of the day, uh, once again, the presence of the Russian peacekeeping contingent in Azerbaijan, on Azerbaijani territory, is a temporary measure to provide for a restoration of normal normalcy between Azerbaijan uh, and Armenia, and also between the Azerbaijani and Armenian population living in, in the region of Karabakh. So I, I think it is very important that Russia maintains a long-term uh, honest broker image to be a you know, force for good in the region. It's not easy. Um, but uh, this is our hope. And just finally, is Turkey playing any role? Obviously, Azerbaijan has, has close relations uh, with uh, Ankara. Uh, do they play any kind of role in this particular dispute around this region? Well, first, uh, we're speaking just as we hear devastating news from the earthquake in, in Turkey. And I want to uh, extend our uh, personal, my personal and our national uh, condolences to our brothers and sisters in Turkey. And the Azerbaijani rescuers just, uh, you know, just flew into Turkey to help. It's a, it's a horrible situation. Uh, Turkey has, in our view, been a very positive contributor to regional development. I mean, if you think about this, uh, Turkey is a major regional player. It's a, it's the only major NATO country in the region. Uh, it has uh, provided a great market for for the region to do. For Georgia, for instance, a great partner for Georgia, not only for Azerbaijan. Now. Not to go too much into details, there is a great uh, benefit of Turkey being there. And one of them is that, and the main benefit is once we have, as Armenia has agreed in its 2020 uh, trilateral statement, to open up communications and road uh, connections and transportation links, including the Zangizur corridor, Turkey becomes a part of this uh, regional arrangement in which Arme borders opened and Armenia has become a regional link, transportation link between Az Central Asia, Azerbaijan and Turkey. And that basically means that Armenia becomes a viable, viable and has a chance to become an economically and finally politically independent country. I mean, we have to understand, we're not speaking about an independent country. It is a basically fully owned external um, subsidiary. So for Armenia to become 
uh, independent country, it has to have some economic ties, it has to have some uh, regional transportation ties, not to be an isolated island uh, within the first person region. They can do that. Uh, Turkey has an incredibly large incentive to this, to its market, to its opening border, to being a part of the integration process. So, to be honest, for the Armenians, I think this is a unique chance, 30 years after formally declaring independence, to actually become independent. But for that, they need to work with their neighbors. We're ready. I think Turkey is ready too. I know, you, uh, Ambassador, you're concerned about uh, an attack on an embassy. Can you explain, uh, ex explain to our listeners and viewers uh, what that's about? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, on January 27th, about 8 a.m. in the morning, uh, an armed gunman uh, tried to enter the embassy of Azerbaijan in Tehran. Uh, in the course of that, he killed one security guard, the chief security guard, and injured two more. Had he succeeded and moved forward, the families living there, uh, the plan was clearly to uh, kill and to decimate the families of Azerbaijani diplomats. Uh, unfortunately, from what we saw, the Iranian security guard posted outside, allowed that to happen, moreover did not act, uh, well we actually saw what's happening. Uh, the Iranian police did not act adequately either, so Azerbaijan today publicly announced that we do not trust the Iranian side to provide security for our diplomatic missions and we were forced to evacuate the, um, uh, the embassy from Iran. That's a very unusual situation. We have long-standing history of neighborhood with Iran. We're neighbors. We have share a lot of culture. There are millions and millions of ethnic Azerbaijans living in Iran, about 30 million. Uh, we're at our longest border. So this kind of behavior sends a very strange message to all of us. Uh, for me, it's especially relevant because last August, uh, embassy here in London was attacked by a radical group, a radical religious group here in London, and we're still waiting uh, for uh, results of the investigation from our British colleagues. But those things put uh, diplomatic security matters into perspective, which I think should be a concern for all of us.